we're really breaking into the middle of a, a trial. The Apostle Paul is speaking to a king, King Agrippa. And he's recounting his conversion when he was saved on the Damascus Road. And as we begin to read at verse 16, this is the words of the Lord Jesus to Saul of Tarsus, as he then was, later to be known as the Apostle Paul. Acts 26 and verse 16. The words of Jesus. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them that they can receive sins and which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. And we do look to God that he might bless his word to our hearts. Further up the chapter, if you want to look at verse 8, you'll notice these words. Again, Paul is still speaking, speaking to Agrippa. And he says in verse 8 of the chapter, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Now, I know it's a week since Easter Sunday, but also it's two weeks until the Jewish Passover, which was the time that the Lord Jesus was actually crucified. So, historically, when it was that the Lord Jesus was crucified and rose again, doesn't it really matter? Because believers... We don't just think about that and rejoicing that and rejoice in that on an annual basis or even a weekly basis. But you know, we rejoice in it every day. We're preaching to you today about a living Savior. And we sometimes sing, and it's wonderful to be able to sing it. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. And let me tell you, the life that Jesus Christ gives is the only life worth having. It's the only life worth having. We were singing there, yes, Jesus loves me. How do we know Jesus loves us? Well, we just look at the cross when they were come to the place that is called the skull. There they crucified him. And the criminals, one on either side, and Jesus in the midst, and listen to this, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, in, in, in essence, what Jesus is saying is, I love you, I love them. There are some people, some preachers, sadly, that say, God doesn't love everybody. He only loves those that love him. That's not true. I can tell you on the authority of God's word, God loves you today. Boy, he loves you. You know, the Lord Jesus looked at a man one day, a man who was going to walk away and leave Jesus. He wasn't prepared for the demands that the Lord Jesus made of him. The Bible says that Jesus looking on him loved him. Oh, God loves you. The Lord Jesus loves you right enough. There are other folks that say, there's nothing that you can do to make Jesus love you more, to make God love you more. That's not true either. Because while God loves everyone, God so loved the world, in a providential sense, the greatest love ever known, ever seen at the cross. But you know, the Bible makes it very clear that God has a special love for those who love his son and who obey his word. The love of relationship. The Lord Jesus tells us that those that love him and those that obey his word, he says, I will come to you and my father will come and make your abode, make, make his abode with us. You know, it's a wonderful thing to know that God loves the world. 
It's even better to know that God loves you personally. I wonder what you think about God's love. God's love has been demonstrated at the cross. The death of Christ. But let me tell you, the death of Christ without the resurrection of Christ would be pointless. A dead saviour couldn't be a saviour at all. Praise God, he's alive. And we're going to see that he changes lives. If you were to read in this passage verses that we didn't read, we read about this man, Saul of Tarsus, what he was like before he met the Lord Jesus on the Damascus Road. He was a murderer. He was the chief persecutor of the Christians. And his life was dramatically altered when he came face to face with Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, your life can be altered too if you have an encounter with Christ. And you can have an, an encounter with Christ because he's alive. He rose. The resurrection of Christ, let me think about it very briefly. Let me give you three proofs of the resurrection. And the first proof is the empty tomb. When the woman went to that tomb the first day of the week, they were met by an angel. That stone rolled away from the, the door of the tomb and the angel sitting upon it. And he said to the woman, Fear not, I know that you seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Come see the place where the Lord lay. You know, there are countless hundreds of thousands of people making pilgrimage to a place in the Middle East where the, the bones of the prophet lie. And they tell me there are hundreds of sites in the Far East where reputedly remains of the Buddha lie. But the word to the woman who came to the tomb is, come see the place where the Lord lay. He is not here, he is risen. It says in Luke's gospel, they found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Why didn't they find the body of the Lord Jesus? Oh, some might say there was a grave robbery. His body was carried away. A conspiracy. Oh, let me tell you, there was a conspiracy, all right. Matthew tells us all about it. But the conspiracy was on, part of the, on the part of the authorities who concocted the story. Soldiers guarding the tomb. But the tomb was empty. The body of Jesus had gone. These soldiers really were liable to be executed because they'd failed in their duty. And they came up with a story. His disciples came and stole the body away while we slept. Just think about that for a minute. Just imagine if it was today and if these soldiers were being interviewed. So what happened here? The tombs opened. Here's the body of Jesus. Oh, his disciples came and, and carried them away, carried him away. So you witnessed this. You saw that, no, no, we were sleeping. It's ridiculous, isn't it? But you know what the authorities did? They gave the soldiers money to put abroad this story. Bribery and corruption. Oh, there was a conspiracy, all right. But let me say again, the tomb was empty, and the tomb is empty because Jesus arose. Second, Second proof of the resurrection is eyewitness account. We've been speaking about the woman who came to the tomb. And in Mark's gospel, we read that the Lord Jesus appeared first to Mary Magdalene after he rose from the dead. But they tell me that in the first century, think of this what you will, but it's fact, that the testimony of the woman of women was not illegally recognized. So we go to 1 Corinthians 15 and the apostle Paul there going read down that chapter and he says he was seen he was seen he was seen he was seen and the pro uh, uh, in the in the mouth of two or three witnesses let every matter be established in first corinthians 15 paul records that on one occasion jesus the living jesus christ 
was seen by more than 500 people at one time. Eyewitness account. Paul goes on to say, last of all, he was seen of me. And that takes us to the third. And perhaps the most relevant proof of the resurrection. And that is the evidence of transformed lives. What would make a man whose whole bent in life was to stamp out the name of Jesus of Nazareth, to arrest Christians and put them in jail? What would make that man turn in such a way that he preached this gospel, that he promoted the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that name that he once sought to stamp out, the power of the risen Christ, the power of the gospel. The gospel transforms lives. Yes, Jesus is alive. I read about, I don't know if you know the name, Chuck Colson, maybe you've heard that name. He was one of the, one of the men implicated in the Watergate affair way back, was it the 70s? By God's grace, he became a believer. He said that one of the one of the, the greatest proofs to him about the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus was the apostles went through their lives, many of them tortured and martyred, and they never changed their story. He said in the Watergate affair, now I can't remember all the details of it, but there was 12 men implicated, and Chuck Colson said, 12 men couldn't keep alive for three weeks. They all eventually broke down and came out. You know, they couldn't keep alive. These apostles of the Lord Jesus, if it was a lie, do you think they would have kept it for 40 odd years and more? Not a bit of that. Jesus is alive and he transforms lives. And here we're reading about this man, Saul of Tarsus, giving this account of his encounter with the risen Christ. And the Lord Jesus instructs him as to what he's to do. Now, the Bible is all important. Every, every chapter, every verse, every line, it's all the word of God. I think verse 18 of Acts 26 is particularly interesting and significant. Because in this verse, think about it. What we have is the risen Christ, the Son of God, giving an exposition of the gospel. And he tells Saul what he's to do. He's being sent to the people, the Jewish people, and to the Gentiles. The Lord is going to preserve him in his, in his service, in his ministry. But what he's to do, look at it in verse 18. He's going to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. That is illumination. You see, as sinners were blind, sin blinds. We need to be made to see. Secondly, to turn them from the power of Satan unto God. That's liberation. You see, sin not only blinds, sin binds. We're captive. We're held captive by the enemy of our souls. If we're not under the lordship of Christ, we're under the domination of Satan. Oh, you see, don't be a, don't be a ridiculous man. You know, the Bible tells us that the whole world lies in the wicked one. You just need to look at our society today. You know, Christ and the gospel can liberate you, can set you free. I don't know if I've mentioned it here before. I remember a song from away, I think it was maybe the late 70s, early 80s, I'm not sure. A song, if you can call it that. And the recurring theme was, we want to be free to do what we want to do. That's where men are. Let's cast over every restraint. Let's just live our lives as we please. 
No restrictions. We want to be free to do what we want to do. And what people find is, as they go overboard into sin, they're no free at all. And there are folks, and I don't want to go into details about addictions, and there are all sorts of addictions. And there's folks that are absolutely sick of their lifestyle and the addiction that they have, and they cannot rid themselves of it. But Christ can. That's the wonder of the gospel. The Lord Jesus can liberate you. He can set you free. So Paul was told he was to go and preach this word. That folks' eyes might be opened, that they might be turned from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God. Make no mistake, in our sin we are blinded. We cannot see clearly. We cannot think clearly. In our sin we are bound. You know, if we had time we could go into many occurrences in the gospel where the Lord Jesus comes across people that are bound by Satan literally. Demon-possessed folks. There's a man, we read about him in Mark chapter 5, I think it is. We call him the Legion. He is demon-possessed. He lives among the tombs. He cries out and he cuts himself with stones. Society could do nothing for him but attempt to bind him with chains and he broke the chains. There was nothing they could, that they could do for him until Jesus came. And Jesus just spoke a word and delivered him. You know, the saviour, the risen, living Lord Jesus Christ can deliver you. Yes, sin blinds and sin binds. But then, the Lord Jesus goes on to say that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Remission. Sin binds, blinds, and sin binds, but sin offends God. And in our sin, we're unfit for God's presence. And if we remain in our sin, dear friend, let me tell you, lovingly, if we remain in our sin, we'll be banished from God for eternity. But you can have your sins forgiven. Isn't that wonderful? Father, forgive them, we said. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As Jesus was nailed to the cross, Father, forgive them. If sin blinds, we can be made to see. If sin binds, we can be made free. If sin offends God, makes us unfit for God's presence, we can be made right. We can be fitted for God's presence. And then fourthly, not only does the believer receive forgiveness of sins, but listen, this is wonderful, and inheritance among them which are sanctified. Sanctification. Sin defiles. Sin makes us unclean. The word sanctifi sanctification, the idea of being sanctified is to be made holy. But more than that, to receive an inheritance, to receive a place, a portion among God's holy ones, my friend. Do you want to go to heaven? One way God said to get to heaven, Jesus is the only way. One way to reach those pearly mansions, Jesus is the only way, the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, sin blinds, sin binds, sin offends, sin defiles. Such is the power of the risen Christ on the grounds of his precious shed blood at the cross. He can make you to see. He can make you free. He can make you right and he can make you holy. So in practical terms, if somebody was to ask me, how do I get this? Where do I find it? See what the last part of the verse says. By faith that is in me. The Lord Jesus says that these blessings are found in him and in him alone. 
by faith. It's all about believing. It's all about believing. Come and ask the question. We repeat this time and again when we're preaching. Not just I, many gospel preachers. What must I do to be saved, to receive the salvation? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That great verse, John 3 and 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Further down that chapter, verse, verse 36, he who believes in the son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. It's ever been thus, right from the dawn of time. You read Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. The Bible says about Abraham in, in Romans chapter 4, that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. What does it mean, Abraham believed God? Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that Abraham just believed that there was a God. No. When someone believes God, what that means is they take God at his word. And they obey God's word. And they recognize God's authority and his sovereignty. The Lord Jesus says these blessings, the blessings of salvation... The blessings of forgiveness, the blessings of sanctification, the great blessing of eternal life is by faith that is in me. In John's Gospel, chapter 6, folks came to the Lord Jesus and they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? For a lot of people, there's many people in our society would be happy if they could get to heaven by doing something, by going on a pilgrimage, by doing some great work. There's nothing wrong with doing charitable work, not at all. But that's not the way to God's salvation. They said, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Listen to the answer that Jesus gave. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he hath sent. <laughs> Dear friend, that's what it's all about. It's about acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord, and it's about trusting in him and in him alone. In Christ alone. Our hope is found. There's no hope anywhere else. Saul of Tarsus had his life transformed. You can have your life transformed as well. I don't know. I don't, I don't know who you are. I don't care how bad you think you are or how good you think you are. If you're not saved, you need salvation. And it's found alone in the Lord Jesus. I'm going to end by reading some verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is the New King James Version of the Bible. Verse 9, the apostle writes and he says this. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Some of the folks in the church in Corinth in the first century had engaged in some of these vile sins. Can I tell you, no matter how vile you feel, no matter how deeply died in sin you are, 
you can do what these Corinthians did. What did they do? First Corinthians chapter 1, they called on the name of the Lord. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Dear friend, you can be liberated. You can be illuminated. You can receive remission of sins. You can be sanctified and be sure of a home in heaven. If you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus says, all this is available by faith that is in me. May God bless his word. Let's close with a brief word of prayer. Our Father, we give thanks today for the experience of Saul of Tarsus so long ago. Coming face to face with the Lord Jesus, asking the question, who are you, Lord? 